In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. The first thing that's strange about this passage from St John's Gospel is that it comes so very early, chapter 2. If I asked any of you who come to church regularly and know the scriptures, when did Jesus cleanse the temple? You would say in Holy Week, just as we're celebrating it now, in the last week of Jesus' life. But here in John's Gospel, it's right at the beginning of his ministry. Just after, in John's Gospel, he begins his public ministry when he has just turned the water into wine at the behest of his mother. Yes, he has been teaching his disciples. He has his disciples with him at the wedding of Cana in Galilee, but he does his first sign at the behest of his mother. He turns the water into wine and he comes to Jerusalem for Passover. And here he goes into the temple. And so the John's Gospel uh, begins with him cleansing the temple. Now, in the commentaries, there's a big discussion. Were there two cleansing of the temples at the beginning of his ministry and at the beginning of Holy Week? And the general consensus is no, there weren't. And that the writer of John's Gospel simply positions the, the only cleansing of the temple here at the beginning of Jesus' ministry uh, rather than where it actually occurred historically. Well, we'll never know. Jesus could have done it twice. Um, he may very well have done but in Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, it occurs at the beginning of Holy Week. Here in John, it occurs at the beginning of his ministry. In each uh, occurrence, it occurs at the beginning of Passover. Interestingly, in the Synoptic Gospels, um, in two of uh, the Gospels, it occurs immediately after the triumphal entry, whereas in one Gospel, it occurs the day after in, in Mark, uh, Jesus goes in and then the day after he goes in and cleanses the temple. And in the Synoptic Gospels, he, he says, you den of robbers. But here he doesn't. He says, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a den of trade. So not accusing them of trying to defraud. He's just saying this isn't what the temple's about buying and selling the sacrificial beasts, um, changing the money from, um, from ordinary coinage into temple coinage. It isn't about the, this sort of sacrifice and the whole mechanics on it. It's about prayer. My father's house is a house of prayer. So what was Jesus doing? Let's go back to the text. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scriptures and the word that Jesus had spoken. Well, what was it that Jesus had said? Now, let's let's see. What, first of all, what did Jesus do? He made a whip of cords and he drove them all out of the temple. All of those he drove out were those who were selling oxen, sheep and pigeon and the money changers. So he, he objected to the fact that the temple was not just a place where anybody could go and pray when the sacrifices were being made. And he wanted to, because the people who were selling uh, the animals for sacrifice, and there was quite a sensible thing to do really because you were only allowed to sacrifice a perfect animal and if you'd come from Galilee and you'd have to drive your animals all the way by the time they got to the temple they probably weren't perfect and therefore you weren't allowed to sacrifice them so the people who were doing it weren't doing it to be cruel they were doing it to be practical to make sure that you did have something fit to sacrifice so they would have made a good case but Jesus is saying no you've missed the point You've missed the point. This is about prayer. This is about offering yourself to God, not about going through a ritual. And the reason it says Jesus made a whip of cords was because people didn't want rebellion in the temple. So everybody was searched going into the temple precinct. So Jesus had something he could make a ceremonial whip out of it. He wasn't trying to raise a rebellion. So he makes a whip of cords and drove them all out of the temple. And when they confront him, and it's obvious they're not confronting somebody who they know is going to actually make a rebellion because they don't uh, take him on. They say to him, what sign are you going to do? What miracle are you about to perform? 
to show us why you've done this. So this isn't some great confrontation with Jesus and his disciples on one side and the temple guard on the other about to square up to one another to have a fight. They recognise that what Jesus has done is not about to take over the temple con con confines and have a riot and take over the place and start a rebellion. They know that's not what Jesus is doing. They know he is making a theological point. And so they ask him, okay, what sign from God are you going to show us in order that we may know you are legitimate? And so he comes back with, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Well, the Jewish people take him literally the leaders of the temple, the people who are running the place, take him literally. They're baffled. But but this amazing temple has taken 46 years to build. And will you raise it up? And his disciples obviously were as baffled because it says in the text, and his disciples remembered that he had said this when he was raised from the dead. They, just like Mary in the Annunciation, she pondered these words in her heart. She pondered these words in her heart. The disciples pondered these words. They remembered. And, and this is not unlikely because this is an oral culture. And so they were his disciples. They were his pupils. Disciple is just a word for pupil. We make it a fancy English word that we don't use in any other context, but actually it's just an ordinary word meaning pupil. They were there to learn from everything that fell from Jesus' lips, to watch everything he did. So he said it, it was significant, and they remembered it. They remembered it. They pondered it. And then, when the worst had happened, and he rose from the dead, they remembered it. And they remembered the scripture, zeal for your house will consume me. So they remembered his symbolic action, cleansing the temple. And they remembered that he himself, as he cleansed the temple, had claimed himself then to be the temple which God would raise after it had been destroyed. Destroy this temple and I will raise it up again. So this is a very complex little piece of scripture. It's not just about Jesus wanting to get rid of the money changers. It puts everything succinctly about the Christian faith into this vivid occurrence. It's saying that God wants us to live a life of prayer and action. That it's not about religion, it's about prayer made real, focused in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, where his resurrection sets prayer alive in the world, and that Jesus' zeal for God's life made real in the world would be his undoing, and that his undoing would be the beginning of our new life. And that's what we are going to celebrate at the end of this Lenten period, when we once again celebrate his resurrection. Amen.